All right. Well, thank you all for coming in today. And you'll see today I've gone ahead uh, and chosen the red wall as our background from the museum. Uh, and that is a memorial wall, really. Uh, the flags that you see virtually represented behind me. You're gone, man. Uh, among these flags, you see one document. And that document, very simply, is General Lee's farewell order to his armies. It's one of the copies of what's called General Order Thank you. Number Nine at the end of the war. So, folks, we are having this meeting today right on the cusp of the annual South Carolina designated Confederate Memorial Day. And I thought for such an occasion that no subject would be better for us uh, than the, the life and some of the messages of a Presbyterian preacher of the 1800s. And the reason I thought this man would be so appropriate is that one of the first important Confederate, Confederate memorial events that occurred in our state was the dedication of the uh, section of Magnolia Cemetery in Charleston in 1871. This was a dedication talk given by a well-known preacher, John Lafayette Gerardot of Columbia, South Carolina. And the occasion was that the Confederate dead of Gettysburg, uh, that those who had been killing, well, now, years later, uh, their remains have been returned to the defeated South Carolina, still under occupation, uh, still undergoing reconstruction, and being returned, were interred under that had the names of Gettysburg casualties from South Carolina on them. But if you visit Magnolia Cemetery in Charleston, there's there's no reason you should think that the remains under those Gettysburg, Gettysburg crosses are actually the same men even. Uh, they're simply casualties from Gettysburg interred there. So it was a sad occasion in a suffering state and it represented in a way this, the suffering of the whole state. It's hard for us to really put ourselves in the shoes of those 19th century people. According to the census, South Carolina had had 60,000 free men of military age in the entire state, 60,000 possible soldiers. And yet over the four years of the war, our state would send more than 63,000 soldiers to war. Uh, many of them underage or overage, but who went anyway. And out of that more than 63,000, more than 21,000, uh, one in three would actually die. So this is a um, wrenching event. And this is why every little town has got downtown a memorial. Uh, this is why the state is marked in so many ways to this day, and why there was a Memorial Day set aside um, to remember these men, and in some ways to try to make some sense out of the whole terrible experience. Well, John L. Gerardot, John Lafayette Gerardot, is our fella who's gonna have really interesting war experiences and then some things to say afterwards. And that's where we're gonna go today. Good looking gentlemen, he was tall, 
He was well spoken. He was mentally very quick. And when John Lafayette Giordo graduated from his seminary training, uh, it was said that his Greek tutor rather than said, There goes a fine Greek scholar to make a poor Presbyterian preacher. Uh, but that wasn't the general opinion. The general opinion was that a very gifted and passionate young man had found his life's work. Uh, none other than Thornwell himself, who was considered the greatest of Presbyterian preachers of his time, he said he'd never heard a better preacher than John Lafayette Giroudot. And this young man, both a scholar and a tremendous eloquent speaker, sometimes composed his own hymns. He wrote poetry. A uh, period description of him said his figure was tall, straight, well proportioned, and athletic. His movements were easy and graceful. His face was strong. And his blue eyes could beam with love or flash with fire as occasion required. His voice was full, rich, and sweet. It was said in the early days of his ministry, it sounded like the notes of a flute. He could make it imitate the lapping of the water on the beach, the roll of distant thunder, or anything else his high wrought and splendid rhetoric called for. In home life, he was a model. He gave his wife the love of his heart and treated her with that consideration that can constitute the first element of chivalry in the old time Southern gentleman. Uh, as a friend, he filled all the ideals of the highest standards. Well, this young gentleman, naturally, uh, the talk was, as he graduated from Columbia Theological Seminary, what rich, influential, prominent pulpit will he fill? This is just exactly the kind of young preacher that every congregation wanted, and that you would figure that probably some of the most socially connected, prominent, important churches would grab a hold of that. So it's fascinating to realize what he thought he ought to do. And what he thought he ought to do, what he believed very much was his um, mission, his calling, was to preach to the slaves and freedmen of the low country. Uh, he fully believed that what he was meant for, that what his ministry calling to do was, was to preach to a black church. And this is all based on the Christian idea that he reiterated and, and sometimes strongly uh, expressed to other people that everybody's soul was of the same value that preference shouldn't be given to the rich, to the powerful, to your own kind, but rather simply that preference should be given, uh, or that um, attention should be given to every soul in need. And so young Gerardo went to preach and to found within a couple of years a new church down in Charleston, uh, Zion Presbyterian Church. And there's a wonderful account of visiting Zion Presbyterian Church. I'm going to read it directly here. Excuse me while I flip to the right page. Uh, there was an out of town visitor who uh, was out of town political event. Handsome pastor, and he's becoming and, a pastor of a black church. Yeah. Folks, could I maybe get you to hit mute on your uh, microphone again? Thank you. Uh, 
this account, it happened in 1860 during the Democrat National Convention in Charleston, which it was a major event for the city uh, and a major event for the nation, really, but that's a separate story. Uh, one of the attendees at that Democratic Convention was a man from Massachusetts, Benjamin Butler. And some of you all who are um, war buffs are going to recognize that name, Benjamin Butler. A couple of years later, as a Union commander uh, and as the fellow put in charge in New Orleans, uh, Butler gets a nickname, Beast Butler, for his policies in that city. Benjamin Butler is going to be one of the most hated Union officers in the South. Well, that night, Butler is there for the political convention, and a fellow delegate told him that there was a gifted young white Presbyterian minister, that this guy had refused calls from big, prominent churches in order to preach at uh, the black church that he founded in Charleston, Zion Presbyterian. And Butler, who was an avid abolitionist, um, and he determined to go see this marvel for himself. Arriving there, he found that the usual seating arrangements were reversed at Zion. Uh, in other churches where slaves and masters would attend together, there would be a separate section for the slaves. It was often up in the balcony. Uh, in this church, predominantly of slaves and of free um, African Americans of Charleston, um, the seating arrangements were reversed. White visitors had to go sit in the balcony, and that's where uh, Benjamin Butler was sitting. His companion that day wrote, the singing was general, heartfelt, and grand. The sermon was tender and spiritual, delivered with fire and I was with closed eyes meditating on the wonderful sermon when I heard someone sobbing. Looking around, I saw General Butler's face bathed in tears. Butler drew from his pockets both hands full of silver and cast it into the basket with the audible remark, well, I've never heard such a man. I have never heard such a sermon. Well, Butler and John L. Gerardo, uh, before a year has passed, are going to find themselves in opposite uniforms from one another. Because Benjamin Butler, of course, goes into the Union Army, and John Lafayette Gerardot, when the war breaks out, is going to temporarily leave his congregation to whom he's preached for all those many years, and is going to become a chaplain for the Confederate Army. Uh, he serves along as part of the 23rd South Carolina Regiment. And this artifact out of the Relic Room's collection, this is actually one of Gerardo's epaulets uh, worn on the shoulder, sometimes called shoulder boards. And that's an interesting note in itself. Most Confederate chaplains did not wear a uniform. Uh, and it was actually not usually very popular with the men for the chaplain to wear a uniform. They liked to see a chaplain who looked like their preachers back home, back home. They liked to see him in a plain black coat with a plain black hat uh, and not walking around with epaulets and, and the fancy aspects of a uniform that indicate an officer. Um, John Lafayette Gerardo was an exception uh, and would serve, apparently, often actually attired in the uniform of an officer. Uh, a lot of opinions varied about chaplain service in the 1860s. It wasn't standardized like it is in today's army. It wasn't standardized in the Northern Army in many ways. Uh, in the Southern Army, it went far beyond that. Everyone agreed the Army should have chaplains, uh, including the legislators who made the rules, but they couldn't agree with each other on what basis the Army should have chaplains. Uh, it seems many legislators thought 
chaplains are important and all the chaplains should be from my denomination. Uh, and that didn't work out well. And so the actual arrangement was that a chaplain would be sponsored by his denomination uh, as a sort of a missionary to the troops. So his status was less than official, but he would take as much danger, or at times more danger, uh, depending on his own personal level of bravery, uh, as anybody else out there. He's out there on the field, generally unarmed, and enduring the hardships of the men that he's out there to minister to. Now, give me a second while I flip to some accounts of John Gerardo's service. He was a man who was generally in the forefront. And whose greatest challenges are gonna happen during the Petersburg siege in 1864. Um, but his first encounters with the enemy are around Charleston, defending his own home area, and by an eyewitness who was there, R.E. Seabrook, uh, and this appeared in the News and Courier in Charleston as a reflection back on the war. Um, not only worthy of a record, but also eminently characteristic of the Christian charity of that good and great man on the morning of June 16th, 1862, I, along with others, was detailed to act as one of a bodyguard and a courier for General Nathan Evans in command of our troops engaged in defense of James Island. General Evans rode into the earthworks in order to make arrangements to meet an assault. As we approached the rear of the work, the first thing that attracted my attention was a large number, 50 or more, of mortally wounded and dying federal soldiers who had been collected and placed in the excavation behind the magazine. In the midst of these, on his knees was Dr. Gerardo, offering up an earnest and eloquent prayer for those dying soldiers, so lately the enemies of all he loved. I was so moved, I forgot war and the dangers incident thereto. In view of the fact that Dr. Joe was an ardent, if not bitter advocate of Southern rights, this triumph of Christian virtue over human nature, this absolute forgiveness accorded to, accorded to dying and no longer active enemies, emphasized his godlike soul and brings out in radiant light the benediction of this true disciple of the master. Uh, and then the man giving the account quotes from the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So minister bo ministry both to his own men, but also to the wounded, and in this case, dying enemy, characterized his service and would become even more so um, uh, notable around the siege of Petersburg. And in the siege of Petersburg, he's gonna be dealing with bitter trench fighting, uh, with casualties, with enemy casualties. And then just a couple of weeks before the surrender, uh, John L. Gerardo is actually captured. Now, perhaps he was not in uniform that day. It's not clear. Because when John L. Gerardo was captured, hold on folks, make sure I've let everybody in that wants to be here. Yes, when John L. Gerardo was captured, he was given a choice. Um, he was told, well, as a chaplain, uh, and you, you know, you're, you're not a soldier, and uh, if you want to, you can leave, you can go home. And John L. Gerardo looked around at the other men who had been captured at the same time. 
and Gerardo inquired of the uh, Union authorities there, well, what is happening to these men? And he indicated some officers nearby. And uh, the officials said, well, they're, they're going to be sent to Johnson's Island prison camp. That is where we send captured officers. And Gerardo said, well, is there a chaplain there? And apparently the Union officer said, well, not as, not as far as we know. He said, well, then, then I'll stay with them. It sounds like that prison camp needs a chaplain. And so John L. Gerardo would end up as a prisoner, but also as the guy who was acting as the chaplain at Johnson's Island Prison uh, in Sandusky, Ohio. Uh, and you see here a drawing of the prison rendered at the time, as well as a rather angry woodcut published three years after the war from the account of a prisoner uh, who said that conditions there were um, horrible and that one officer in particular had issued orders to shoot anyone who left the stifling hot barracks uh, in order to get some air and get out into the exercise yard at an unauthorized time and that a young lieutenant from Arkansas there was gunned down. Um, this terrible place, and you didn't want to be in any of the camps that were run by either side in the 1860s, but this terrible place turned out to be a very fruitful place for ministry for John Lafayette Gerardo. Many people under hardship were ready to listen to his messages of comfort and inspiration. And in fact, they said that when he would um, begin his preaching, that often the federal guards would listen closely to the crowd, and that eventually boats would actually come in to hear him on Monday morning of civilians from town. His manner, they said, was a vivational, uh, vivacious conversational address. As some great thought flashed before him, his ro voice rose to the highest range of impassioned utterance. I have heard him preach to 1,000 to 1,500 soldiers with all the distractions of camp about them. Sometimes in expectation of immediate battle, the whole mass of men were held spellbound by his eloquence. My cousin, a major of artillery, was a prisoner at Johnson's Island. Dr. Gerard o was taken prisoner, carried to this island. He preached very often in the prison. His platform was the center of a great circle from which the streets radiated to the various sections of the barracks. My cousin told me that when Dr. Gerardo preached, not only the circle, but the streets, as far as he could be heard, were crowded with eager listeners, Confederates and Federal Guards all mingled together, held by a common interest. He said many men dated their conversion from these services. So John L. Gerardo saw the ugly side of war. Uh, he served soldiers of both sides in spiritual need. Uh, not letting his own very strong Southern politics get in the way of that duty. And he returned at the end of the war, uh, as you can imagine, ragged, having lost a lot of weight as a POW. But when the word came that he was coming in on the train in Charleston, the members of his uh, Black congregation of Zion Presbyterian Church would meet him at the train station to lift him on their shoulders and carry him through the streets in celebration that their beloved minister had returned. So he would return to a heavily divided state and to some serious questions. He had a good friend, Robert Dabney, and some of you who are war buffs will have read perhaps uh, Robert Dabney's uh, biography of Stonewall Jackson. Uh, Robert L. Dabney was another prominent Presbyterian. They were good friends, 
And they had some serious disagreements over time. Uh, one of them happened immediately after the war when Robert Dabney published a paper about how the Presbyterian Church should deal with the freed slaves. And um, Jared O took exception to it. Uh, Dabney was arguing that things hadn't really changed in their arrangements just because uh, occupation forces were in place and the laws had been changed, that things should pretty much be done the same as they always had been. Uh, Jared O said, uh, and he had a lot of experience from leaders that he had trained in his own congregation, that no, the legal change was not simply a legal change, uh, that if these were now free men, they also needed to rise in church leadership and particularly to become elders, which uh, in Presbyterian church government is a very important thing uh, to become an elder. So they actually had a sort of published debate over this. And two years after the war, Jared o had a paper published that you can still read about uh, the importance of making these men elders. Uh, he knew them well, uh, and he knew a lot about how at least the members of his church had been prepared for leadership. Back in the days before the war, uh, Jared o at one point early in his ministry had actually attracted some negative attention from people who believed that he was running secret classes to teach the slaves uh, uh, how to read and write, which was actually against the law at that time, apparently because his catechism classes were so effective. And his catechism classes were based apparently primarily on memorization. But he knew a lot about the leadership capacities of some of the folks that he'd been working with all that time. And he argued that they began to transition up to the elder position. This is a couple of years before he gives his great memorial sermon in 1871 at the dedication of Magnolia Cemetery. That talk is one I'm going to focus on a little bit today because, again, we are almost right next to, uh, we're almost right on top of Confederate Memorial Day. And few men were ever quite as eloquent in their expression of what memorialization was and what it should mean. Uh, John L. Gerardo is somebody who is looked up to as a spiritual leader in the state, both by his own congregation and those many who have heard of him uh, across the state for his preaching, and by former soldiers, because they are very much aware of his bravery in service as a chaplain and of the hardships that he underwent at Johnson's Island prison camp. So that makes his voice especially important. And the choice of who was going to talk that day in 1871 was going to be an important choice. The state was still under military occupation uh, to preach something that might be considered uh, sedition, to preach something that might be considered rebellion, uh, would be to invite reprisals, to not give these men their due, and to not uh, encourage uh, and reassure those who had lost their family members. Uh, that would be falling short of his duties. But John Lafayette Gerardo was used to complicated duties. This talk in 1871, he had to balance reactions of different parts of the audience and the media. Uh, but if I can flash back to before the war, when he was just a young preacher, at one point, a member of his congregation had been arrested uh, involved with a murder case, and it was a racially charged murder case. And Gerardo said he was going to preach the next Sunday a, a relevant message to that situation. 
And he was new in his career, and folks were sort of suspicious of a white minister who had decided to pastor a black church. They wondered if he was going to preach insurrection. And a group of uh, critics and opponents and frightened men, frightened men posturing, uh, said that they were going to attend his church that Sunday and bring revolvers. And if they began to, if he began to preach sedition, they were going to shoot him down in the pulpit. And a group of Gerardo's friends heard about this plot. They let it be known that they also were going to attend. They were going to sit in the balcony too. They were also bringing revolvers. And if anybody started to shoot at their favorite preacher, they were going to shoot back. So uh, a loaded situation in more ways than one. And John L. Gerardo got up that Sunday morning with loaded weapons in anticipation of what he was going to say and loaded weapons anticipating defending him. And he got up and preached a sermon on the situation that was being undergone. And the sermon was uh, based on the proverb that says, don't be deceived. Bad company will corrupt good morals. And happily, neither said bad company with their weapons decided that the sermon was going to make them open up. Well, here in 1871, facing a tough political and social situation, uh, listen a little to some of the things that he had to say as people gathered on that spring day uh, to memorialize men who had died eight years earlier at the Battle of Gettysburg and whose unidentified remains uh, Many of them selected simply because they found a, a skeleton with a belt buckle with a palmetto on it to be returned to South Carolina. As these remains are being interred, here's some pieces of what John L. Gerardo said. The circumstances which assemble us in the streets of this city of the dead are in the last degree solemn, tender, and affecting the bones of our brethren have for nearly eight years been sleeping in the graves in which they were laid on the bloody battlefield of Gettysburg. Their repose was unbroken by the roar of subsequent conflicts, by the wild wail of grief which broke forth at the fall of their beloved country, or by the triumphal honors paid to the memories of those who battled against the cause for which they died, and fell on the same field with them. The wounded who survived for a brief while the carnage of that day turned amid their last thoughts on earth to the state they had loved so well, even as dying children to a mother, and ere they yielded up their gallant spirits, breathed the fervent entreaty, send our bodies to South Carolina to be buried there. Gerardo doubtless is thinking of similar scenes in which he was the one ministering to the dead and to the dying. He said they were left to sleep apart. Uh, they were placed in separate graves, he means mass graves. We could not have wished it otherwise. They had contended for their rights and occupied graves by themselves, in death as in life, adhering to a noble and sacred though despised and execrated cause. They were entitled to strangers' accommodations, and they received them, but they will no longer sleep alone. Their dying wish is fulfilled. Their isolated repose has been interrupted by the gentle hands of their country women who have tenderly removed them from alien graves and brought them hither. They have come home at last. We receive them not as conquerors, else would a whole people with military pageant have escorted them to their coveted repose. But nonetheless, honor on that account shall be awarded them. Not one chaplet, not one laurel wreath shall be withheld, albeit twined with the willow and the cypress. Not the roll of drums, the blast of bugles, and the thunder of cannon, but the throb of grief, the quick flowing tear, the yearning of an unspeakable love, that boundless admiration, undying gratitude, and unconquered principles can give. 
These are the tribute we offer you today. Afflicted Carolina, rise in thy mourning weeds and receive thy returning children to thy maternal breast. Fill them softly there, for there they prayed to sleep, their long and dreamless sleep. Here let men who never surrendered except to death find a fitting resting place in a spot overlooking the waters which were never parted by a hostile keel so long as an artilleryman remained within his port to fire the guns which guarded them. Here let them sleep with those who never looked upon a conqueror's flag floating over the citadels of a southern sovereign state. Shoulder to shoulder they stood, now let them lie side by side. Confederates in life, Confederates, let them be in death. And Jerda goes on in his talk, and I think he says some things that are important. Um, some of those things that, uh, you know, sometimes we talk broadly about the lessons of history. And the lessons of history are not always as simple as we like, and they're not always in the direction, maybe, that we're looking for. But one of the lessons, I think, of history, if we look at the two sections of the nation coming together after four years of terrible war, John L. Jardot had never been moderate politically, and he'd never been shy about giving his opinions on the great questions surrounding the nation or what ought to be done. After the war, he was very much a voice that said, Southerners continue to be Southerners, to memorialize the dead, to honor their bravery, to look to their principles. And he was careful to enumerate what he believed those principles were and how they should be carried forward. And John Gerardo was also a voice of reconciliation that bitterness should not drive policy, that revenge was not a Christian virtue or something that should be carried out, that the new situation that he'd never really anticipated, he hadn't really anticipated the situation of the abolition of slavery, but that this new situation was something that uh, should be risen to as a challenge and um, should be something where Christian virtues could be expressed, including in raising some people that he had trained to leadership now that they were eligible for it. So I think one of the lessons of history here is that for people to reconcile, to get together after a terrible struggle, it is not necessary not even likely that those people are going to look backwards and say, hey, you won the fight, so I guess you were right all along. That's not how human beings really behave. People who are dedicated enough to something to fight for it are probably not going to change their minds about their cause simply because it's been militarily defeated. However, People can see a duty to find common ground with those that they fought against and to work on other issues together that are of mutual benefit. A lot of ministers like Jared Doe, uh, and I include here Northern ministers, Northern and Southern ministers who believe strongly that their cause had been righteous and just, that they had done the right thing, and that in the same circumstances they would do it all over, could find themselves now in new circumstances and be able to work together with the guy off the other side who had thought exactly different about the previous fight. So John Gerardo leaves us with some thoughts that to carry down tradition across time is a noble work that it's something that needs to be done deliberately, that a society that doesn't tell its stories and maintain its heroes 
and explain their principles is not a society that's going to last. At the same time, uh, he says that grievance and vengeance are not what such a society ought to be defined by. Ultimately, Gerardo's legacy would go far beyond memories of the war. He's gonna become a seminary professor after the war. He's gonna write extensively on theological issues. And some of those issues are um, ones that are not so resonant anymore. Some of them will be permanently resonant issues. The question of uh, free will and predestination, of course, is very central to Presbyterian theology. And Gerardo's big academic work, The Will and Its Theological Relations, uh, is a very interesting and insightful look into that permanent question. Another of books, the books he would write in the 1880s was a uh, ferocious defense of the Presbyterian tradition of that time of not having musical instruments in church. Uh, he's a strong opponent of having musical instruments in church and makes distinctions that uh, seem a, a little foreign to us in the 21st century because he's all for the use of musical instruments when you're singing hymns at home with your family in private worship, simply not in the formal um, setting of the church. And the churches in his day have a very rich tradition of um, a cappella singing. And it is a tradition that, that we definitely can look back and say, yes, allowing musical instruments in church pretty much destroyed that particular tradition, although we might not feel as strongly theological about it as John L. Gerardo did in the 1880s. So that's a question that's kind of come and gone. Uh, another question that became a big one in the American scene that he got involved with early was uh, the question of evolution. And the teaching of the theory of evolution in the development of mankind uh, was very controversial. And there was actually a professor at the Presbyterian Seminary who was trying to join together the ideas of uh, Charles Darwin with the account in Genesis. And Jared O is an elder statesman of the church, uh, had some words to say about that as well. Uh, so a real interesting man uh, who was always engaged with the big issues of his day. And if you visit today Elmwood Cemetery, John L. Gerardo has my favorite gravestone at Elmwood. You'll see a picture of it here. And if you look closely, John L. Gerardo, 1825 to 1898, it is the height and the shape of a pulpit. And you've got a marble pulpit cloth on it and a um, open Bible on top of it. And you can step up to that pulpit and preach to the graveyard today. So, Gerardo, a fascinating guy. You can look up and read his entire address. It's much longer than the excerpts I gave you today at the dedication of Magnolia Cemetery in 1871. And he was a guy whose life uh, left a, a major, major mark in the Presbyterian community, in the South Carolina community, and on national history. It's worth mentioning as well that two of his grandsons, if you visit that gravestone in Elmwood Cemetery in Columbia. Two of his grandsons are buried just a few yards away. Uh, their rank of each of them is listed as well on their gravestones. Both of them fought in the First World War. Um, and Gerardo's daughter-in-law, Miss Carolyn Gerardo, uh, she was the lady who for decades ran 
uh, a wonderful museum in Columbia by the name of the South Carolina Confederate Relic Room. So when you come and visit us after the quarantine is over, we have some terrific memorial items on display that give you more of an idea of how the dead were honored and the legacy carried forward in the late 1800s. And in one drawer, you can actually see the tiny scrap that's the last piece left of the original Hampton Legion flag, an item that was donated to the Relic Room by none other than John Lafayette Giroudeau. Thank you all for listening to me today. Uh, before I close, I'd like to refer back to that story from 1860 and the attendance of Benjamin Butler at one of Giroudeau's religious services and reflect that although Giroudeau did not command a regiment or a brigade, although his activities on the battlefield and in prison uh, had to do with the comforting of bodies and minds and the saving of souls and not with combat, that before the war even started, John Lafayette Giroudeau achieved something that no other Confederate officer ever achieved. John L. Gerardeau made Beast Butler cry. Thank you all very much. Uh, does anybody have any questions today? You can use the chat function to get to them. Um, those of you who want to dig deeper into the history, let me find my copy of it. One of the better accounts, now it, it is, of course, a religious account. You can tell by the title, Preachers with Power by Douglas Kelly, uh, is about four stalwarts of the South, as it says, but one of the four preachers focused on uh, a, a good biography you can get of John Lafayette Giroudeau uh, is in this book, Preachers with Power. Um, that one will give you a good overview of his career. Again, the 1871 dedication of Magnolia Cemetery, you can find that full text that's out there. Uh, there are a number of very good uh, books have been done on the chaplains of the war, both North and South. Uh, so there's a lot more research you can do on this very interesting 